Okay, so hello everybody. Snow is piling up and I want to give you feedback on your uh, muddiest questions or muddiest points from last week. We covered a lot of material in methods and uh, had to, so we uh, took it kind of slow and I wanted to address and try to help you out with some of the more confusing concepts. So uh, to start, yes, I want my pen. Confounds and extraneous variables and how they fit into an experiment. Okay, so let's talk about those. So uh, here's one version of the experiment that uh, I had in the uh, recorded lecture about experimental methods. Uh, the uh, students watched either the control video or the violent uh, cartoon video. And then two raiders uh, recorded aggressive acts during 30 minutes of recess. And the same dependent variable was used. And then uh, in watching the students, the uh, you know 15 students for 30 minutes in the control group, the two observers agreed upon five acts of aggression. In the experimental group, the two raters agreed upon nine acts of aggression. And so this would uh, cause us, these results here, would cause us to say yes, indeed the hypothesis is correct. Watching the violent videos would cause more aggression. However, uh, I hope you see that there's a problem here. Uh, this was 10 a.m. and this was 2 p.m. So uh, these two experiments were conducted at different times of the day. Would uh, kindergarten or first grade students respond the same at uh, 10 a.m. versus 2 p.m.? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, there could be a lot of differences. Uh, they may have been hungry here and crabby, and that may have caused them to not want to be as active during their 30 minutes of recess. They may have had lunch uh, with sugary treats in it and may be still hyper after that lunch. Uh, you know, they could be sleepier here. They could be more awake here. So in general, what's going on is the time of day is an extraneous variable. It's an, a variable outside of our two variables that we want, the independent variable and the dependent variable. Or there's the dependent variable, and that's a mess let me change the color of my pen if I'm going to talk about this more. Uh, so what we see here is that there is a variable that's external to the IV and the DV that is a third variable and that is an extraneous variable but also this extraneous variable co-varies with the level of the independent variable. The subjects that get the violent video always get it at 2. The subjects who get the control video always get it at 10. That's co-varying where they go together. And when an extraneous variable co-varies with the independent variable, that's a confound variable. So what we say now is that time of day is confounded with the independent variable. And so that technically makes the results of this experiment uninterpretable. What causes the greater amount of aggression uh, you know, after watching the violent video? Is it the violent video or is it the time of day? We don't know. And so doing an experiment just to end up saying we don't know is not something you want to do. Uh, so that's uh, why confound uh, variables are bad. Extraneous variables may or may not be bad. Uh, it depends on the situation. 
uh, when we get to uh, Psych 330 or 4.30, <clears throat> I joke around with my students and say, I'm going to spend the entire semester explaining to you why the difference, uh, the difference between when extraneous variables are good and when extraneous variables are bad. It's a complicated uh, topic, but uh, you know, you know, when extraneous variables become confounded, that's when they're bad. So, uh, more clarity about what extra variables are. Well, remember, when we talk about the dependent variable and the, uh, you know, independent variable and extraneous variables, we're saying that they're variables, and so they vary. And so, in the experiment we design, two things to vary uh, the independent variable, and that's varying because its level is manipulated to different levels by the researcher. That is, as a researcher, I choose who goes into one experiment or the other, or one condition or the other, violent versus nonviolent cartoons. And I do that however I wish. In this case, I probably randomly assign subjects uh, to re reap the benefits of that. Uh, the dependent variable is a variable because it varies. It varies based on the behavior of the students. Time of day also varies, but it's not the IV or the DV, so therefore it's an extraneous variable. And if we look at our experiment, what else could be varying? Uh, the weather, the temperature, the children's energy level, and indeed that's probably what's going on. However, due to my manipulation of the independent variable, I'm relatively protected, or the experiment is relatively protected from these other extraneous variables, but they are a concern. And in general, you want to limit the amount of extraneous variables you have in your experiment just to make sure they don't become confounded. But time of day definitely is confounded. Weather, temperature, energy level, we would have to measure those variables to determine if they're confounded with time of day. And so uh, we have the two confounded conditions here. So what we need to do then is we need to develop an experiment where we don't confound them. And so this would be an example of an experiment without that confounding. And it's not confounded because you notice uh, I make the uh, time of day constant. It's the same time of day for all subjects. So it's no longer a variable, so it can't be an extraneous variable. It can't be confounded. It's controlled. And uh, so therefore, in this experiment here in the blue, when we see that there are nine acts of aggression and five acts of aggression in the control group, we can make the conclusion that the type of video watched causes greater uh, you know, aggression of the children. Okay, and that just reviews uh, what I said before about extraneous variables being confounded. And I've already gone over this, so I'm not going to go over this again, but just I wanted to go over basically the whole idea of confounding and how it makes the results uninterpretable. But I've already done that, I think, pretty well, so I'm not going to do it again. Okay, other questions I got. Uh, validity versus validity. And this is indeed confusing, and there's no way around this. Uh, in psychology, we use the term validity to refer to how valid an experiment is. And there are several different types of validity internal validity, external validity, ecological validity, and construct validity. And in construct validity, we're talking mainly about how well the construct measures, uh, you know, how well the operational definition measures the construct. This is the same thing in psychometrics or measurement theory as validity or construct validity. Uh, these others are different types of validity. And so in psychometrics, we're mainly talking about reliability and validity. Those are the two important concepts that we're interested in. And uh, a student uh, confused reliability and validity. So just to make sure, 
Reliability means being able to measure the same thing twice and get the same number. Validity means you want to measure uh, what you intend to measure. Uh, reliability is where you have a lack of error in the experiment or a lack of error in your measurement of a variable. Uh, and construct validity means that the test score measures the construct and just the construct, nothing else. When we say that somebody is reliable, we mean that they're trustworthy, and that's what it means in measurement theory. That is, the score, the number we get, we can trust it uh, because we're going to get the same number again and again. The person's not going to change their mind. They're trustworthy. They're reliable. Uh, valid means truthful, and that's what we mean in construct validity. The uh, number we get is truthful in that it's related to whatever real thing it's being measured. And we measure reliability by doing a test-retest reliability, split halves, multiple forms. These are all methodological ways of measuring reliability. In test-retest, what we do is we, as the name implies, we give somebody the test. We wait an appropriate amount of time. That depends on the test. We give them the test again, and then we correlate the scores of the two groups together. So I'll give 30 students a test I want to uh, you know, determine the reliability on. Then I'll give it uh, to them again a week later, and then I'll correlate their scores together. And the correlation coefficient will be our measure of reliability. Another way to measure reliability is the Kronbach Alpha. And this is purely statistical, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And I say here that one way to measure validity, uh, construct validity, is through divergent and convergent validity. And I'll talk about that in a minute also. OK, so a lot or some of the confusions that students have come from the fact about construct validity come from the fact that the topic is controversial. Ooh, my mouse ran into a cat whisker on the mouse pad. Uh, so, uh, you know, you talk to different psychologists, you'll get different answers. Uh, so that is one problem with talking about construct validity. Uh, so what I want to do is just focus on the type of construct of validity I think is the most important and easiest to understand. And that's uh, what we get through the multi-trade approach. Now, I realize I could really just talk about divergent and convergent validity without talking about the multi-trait, multi-method approach. And that just probably confuses you more. So maybe just forget about the MTMM approach and just think about these two different types of uh, you know, uh, validity, divergent and convergent. Divergent validity is based on the idea that things that measure different things should not agree. Uh, so if I have a, a test that measures uh, you know, gender role, and a test that measures lifestyle uh, enjoyment. Those two tests measure different concepts, so the scores you get from them should be very different. Uh, that is, they should be no correlation, it should be zero. However, tests that measure similar things, so let's say that I have a test that measures uh, gender and another test that measures gender role, they measure similar things, so we should see a correlation between scores on those two tests. Not a perfect correlation, but we should see a stronger correlation than divergent. And so we can talk about things such as need for cognition. This is a scale that measures your need for cognition. That is how much you want to or need to think about things. Some people don't really need to think about things, they just act and experience. Other people uh, can't act and can't just experience, they need to think about what they're seeing, they need to think about what they're going to do. And so we say, well, we want to 
somehow develop measures of construct validity for need for cognition? Well, we need to find a similar and dissimilar test. So a similar test would be need for structure. Uh, some people don't need structure in their lives. Other people need to have their lives organized. And you can look at the concepts and say, yeah, need for cognition. Somebody wants to think about things and plan things. Oh, we're talking about planning things and organizing things. We're talking about need for structure. These two concepts are similar. So we could probably use this for uh, convergent validity. Uh, and then we have need for cognition, the test we want to validate. Uh, a dissimilar construct could be IQ, intelligence. Uh, intelligence is about thinking, but it's about more or less solving problems. So it should not be similar to your desire to think problems through. Uh, it should be about problem solving. So your IQ score and your score on a need for cognition test should be different from each other and there should be a low correlation. And so when we correlate need for cognition and IQ, uh, the correlation should be low and that will give us divergent validity. When we correlate need for cognition with need for structure, that correlation should be high. And if we get low divergent validity, low scores when we correlate need for cognition and IQ, and high scores when we correlate need for cognition and need for structure, that would give us evidence that we have good construct validity for our need for cognition test. Uh, the most muddiest concept is content, criterion, and construct validity. Oh, there goes a fire engine. Uh, so uh, when should we use them? Uh, use all three. And I'm presenting you a kind of pared down version of psychometrics or testing and measurement. And so yes, uh, if you're going, you know, and this gets back to the idea because all three of these are related to construct validity. Uh, the controversy in how we should measure construct validity or the controversy in what construct validity is. Uh, and some people are from a different approach than I am, uh, which says that the way you actually measure construct validity is you have people evaluate the questions to see if they really match up with the construct. And that's okay, but I don't think it's really that important or useful uh, but, you know, if you have a test that, for example, has good content validity, that is, experts look at the items and say, oh, these items definitely relate to need for cognition. And then you look at criterion validity, uh, where you give people the need for cognition test, and then you uh, observe a behavior that should be related to the construct need for cognition. And those two should uh, correlate the, uh, you know, their behavioral scores on how well they want to have, th they want to think things through first, versus their score on the need for cognition test. Those should correlate highly. And if they do, and then also the divergent and convergent validity, the divergent is low, and the convergent validity is high. Uh, when you correlate need for cognition to different measures then that would make me very, very confident that my need for cognition scale is very uh, you know, valid in terms of construct validity. One of the least clear concepts uh, is how reliability would work in terms of experiments. Uh, okay, well, let's do an example. So an experiment that I uh, did a couple years ago was I was looking at fandoms, that is, people who are fans of different things. Uh, and usually we're talking about media. And I was looking at the Big Lebowski fans. This is a strong fandom that has been going on for, you know, 20 some years. Excuse me, I needed some tea. And I developed a hypothesis that <clears throat> uh, the fandom uh, attracts people who are like the characters from the media. And so the 
uh, Big Lebowski fandom is attracting people who are like the Big, Le uh, who are like the dude. Uh, that is, the dude does not really trust government. That's really one defining thing about the dude. And so, uh, I developed the hypothesis that uh, you know the more closer you're psychologically involved with the fandom the more you distrust the government. So what I'm saying is, uh, you know, clo you know uh, possibly distrust of the government will cause people to flock to this fandom. And so I'll ask you, what are the two operational definitions here? That is, what are the two constructs that we need to measure and how should I go about measuring them? Stop the uh, video and think about that and then restart it. So the two constructs and the two operational def definitions we're talking about is closeness to the fandom, that is psychological closeness to uh, this fandom, and distrust in the government. And so what I needed to do was find a measure of how psychologically close somebody is to a fandom, and I had to find a measure of how much people distrust the government. Uh, and first off, could not, of course, find a measure of how psychologically close somebody was to the Big Lebowski fandom. It hasn't been designed yet. And the uh, measures that exist that measure distrust in the government really didn't do a good job of getting at just this general distrust. So what I had to do was I had to create two new tests to measure both of these things before I could get the numbers from these tests and uh, evaluate my hypothesis. So here's a poster uh, that I presented a couple years ago uh, about uh, the uh, psycho uh, psychological sense of community for the Big Lebowski fans. And here are the items that uh, I put on the test and this is the pencil and paper test or the online test of uh, how psychologically close you are, uh, you know, how psychologically important being a Big Lebowski fan is uh, to you. And so these are the items on it. <clears throat> I think Big Lebowski fandom is a good place for me to belong. I feel at home in the Big Lebowski fandom. In general, being a part of the Big Lebowski fandom is important to my self-image. Uh, I don't feel a sense of being connected with fellow Big Lebowski fans. Uh, that's negatively related. So the uh, it's a negative correlation. Uh, I have a lot in common with fellow fans. I know people who are part of the Big Lebowski fandom. And I have almost no influence over the Big Lebowski fandom as like. And that is, is also reversed uh, coded. And so... Hmm. Some, I just noticed something's wrong with my poster. Whoops. Okay, so uh, I missed a couple things. Uh, so uh, this is the test that I created. I created it based by borrowing it from other research that has looked at psychological sense of community and adapting it to the Big Lebowski fandom. But now I made this test. Does it work? That is. Is it reliable, and is it uh, you know uh, valid? The basic questions. So, next page. Uh, so what I did was I did statistical analyses to see whether or not it is reliable and it is uh, valid. So first off, as you can see here, Chromeback Alpha 0.79. Uh, that is a good, not a great, but a good. Chromeback Alpha. So this is reliable. That is, if I have a subject take my survey and then a month later have them take it again, what's going to happen is the numbers that I get are going to be very similar for uh, each subject. So it's reliable. That is, th my test will measure the same thing several times and give me the same numbers. Uh, I had to do something and this is weaker, but what I did was I had to somehow assert some type of construct validity. And so uh, here's where I talk about that. 
and stop the video for a second and answer what type of construct validity is that? And then start it when you think you know the answer. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm taking my uh, test which measures uh, how psychologically close people feel or say they feel uh, to the fandom and then I'm correlating it to different behavioral criteria and I'm using that to give me a, a sense of criterion validity which is a version of one of the versions of construct validity and so uh, I do have a valid and reliable test that I could use to give to people and then I developed a test to measure your trust in the government and I gave that to people and yes uh, there's a correlation between uh, your closeness uh, to the uh, Big Lebowski fandom and your lack of trust in the government uh, the closer you are to the fandom the more you distrust the government and there is bigger so you can read it easier okay and statistics uh, I understand the vocabulary words just not finding the statistics a couple people said that perfectly fine uh, when you take psych 330 uh, nope I'm sorry psych uh, 226 uh, uh, if you ever do that's when you're going to learn how to calculate these uh, but you don't have to for this class all you have to do is know what they are so you should have a good idea of the uh, you know what the mean is the mean is a measure of central tendency uh, and so to calculate the mean we often call this the average but that's a little bit vague for statisticians we take all the numbers we add them up and we divide by n uh, this is the balance point of the distribution if each uh, you know person or score on the distribution uh, would uh, you know be a penny on a ruler and we stack the pennies on the rulers based on your scores or your position in the distribution and stuck a pencil under the uh, ruler uh, the yardstick uh, the balance point would be the mean so it's the balance of everything variability of a distribution indicates how much the scores in the distribution differ from each other across the response scale. So if I had a 1 to 5 rating scale for survey items and most participants used 2 to 4, the distribution would have low uh, variability. However, if the uh, respondents used 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this would have a higher variability. And so again, low val uh, variability and higher variability and the standard deviation is just the square root of variability and so the standard deviation is a measure that represents the average distance between the scores and the mean of the distribution if you were simply to cal calculate the differences between the scores and the means and add them up you would find that they all come to zero because that's a definitional property of the mean uh, that is uh, and the standard and the variance uh, the the mean is the point uh, which is in the middle mathematically of the distribution and so the uh, variance or the distance from the mean to each individual member will add up to zero for every distribution and you determine the standard deviation by calculating the differences between each score, squaring those values, adding them up, and dividing by uh, you know, uh, n minus 1, uh, where n is the number of scores. And then you take the square root. So again, variance is simply the standard devi uh, deviation squared. Standard deviation and variance are, you know, uh, important measures in most inferential statistical tests and then finally uh, I mentioned earlier how you get test retest re reliability or you get split halves or you get uh, uh, different forms of uh, uh, re uh, reliability and those are all methodological issues test retest you give somebody your test and then you give it to them you know a week later or a month later 
uh, different forms, uh, you uh, give people, you split up your questions into two different forms, you give people the two different forms, and then you correlate them together. Uh, split halves, you don't even give them different forms, you just cut the test in half and say, I'm going to treat the first 10 questions as a questionnaire, and I'm going to treat the last 10 questions as the next 10 questions, or the last 10, as a questionnaire, and then you correlate the two together. That's all methodological. Uh, however, Chromebacks Alpha is just statistical. You give people the test once, and from that one uh, you know, uh, administration of the test, you can statistically uh, get something that is very similar to test-retest reliability. And here's the formula you use. And Essentially, you, you, can get, you can groove on the numbers if you do that, but if you don't groove on the numbers, then what's really going on is this, is that what you're doing when you calculate the Kronvac Alpha is you're imagining that each item is its own test, and then you're looking at the correlation between this item and every other item. Uh, and you're doing some you know, mathematical things to make it work, but that's the concept of what you're doing. And so whenever you're in a situation where you can't give test-retest, uh, you, know, uh, you can't use a test-retest methodology, or uh, you can't use multiple forms, or you can't use split halves or don't want to, uh, you can just statistically calculate what Chromebacks Alpha is. And that's my answers to your questions. If you have more questions, uh, ask them on the office hours form and I'll answer them. Bye bye. Discard. Now turn you off.